This is the Tudor's Dynasty Podcast. Hello, welcome to the show. I'm your host, Rebecca Larson, and since 2017, I've been exploring and sharing with you the stories of those who lived in 16th century England. This is episode 98. Today's episode is another fun one. I lead off with Dr. Nikki Clark about my all-time favorite Tudor woman, Mary Howard, Duchess of Richmond. Then Dr. Nicola Tallis is back for our Ask the Expert segment, where she answers your questions about Margaret Beaufort. And lastly, I tell you all about Jane the Fool. Tudor Con is just around the corner. Do you have your digital tickets yet? They're $29 and you'll get two days worth of speakers, including yours truly. I'm speaking on Saturday, October 3rd, and I'll include a link in the show notes so you can check out more info yourself. Now, please hang tight with me a moment while I thank my newest patrons. Now, if you're listening to this right now, it's because of the support of all of my amazing patrons. And I have 15 new ones since the last episode. I can hardly believe it. I really do feel the love, you guys. And thank you, thank you, thank you. Marie M, Rayanne B, Lisa D, Elska V, Allie S, Lynn H, Carrie C, Janae E, Gail L, Sherry C, Melissa K, Sarah W, Stephanie C, Lauren S, and Amy Z. And a big thank you to all of my existing patrons as well. You know, you can find a full list at TudorsDynastyPodcast.com or you can become a patron through Patreon. And lastly, I now have a shop with some fun tees, face masks, sweatshirts, totes, mugs, and more. If you have any suggestions for designs, please feel free to reach out to me. Otherwise, you can also find a link in the show notes. My guest today is Dr. Nikki Clark. Nikki is historian of early modern England and a senior lecturer at the University of Chichester. And her book, Gender, Family, and Politics, The Howard Women, 1485 to 1558, is the first full-length, gender-inclusive academic study of the preeminent Tudor family, the Howards. In her book, she returns women to their rightful place in the political and national narrative of Tudor history. Nikki, welcome to the show. Hi, thanks for having me. I am so excited to have you on today to talk about one of my favorite women in Tudor history, Mary Howard. Before we get started, let's talk a little bit about your knowledge on Mary and uh, where you got that from. Well, at the beginning of my PhD, I knew that I wanted to work on women during the Tudor period. So I spent quite a lot of time with Henry VIII's letters and papers, doing a lot of reading. And I started to notice that Howard women just kept popping up everywhere. I literally couldn't get away from them. Even if they didn't actually have the surname Howard or they were known by a different married name, once I took the time to work out who those women were, the odds were high that there was some kind of link to the wider Howard dynasty. Um, So at that point, I drew a massive family tree on like A3 or A2 paper or something, including all the women, which a lot of them don't usually. And then I put a red dot next to everyone who got executed. And there were so many red dots. It was unbelievable. And there were also a huge number of women surrounding all those figures that we already know about, like Anne Boleyn or like the Duke of Norfolk. And I realized that I had something here. I wanted to look at those women around them to try and better understand how families at court really worked, whether women did just do as they were told or whether there was more to it. And Mary Howard caught my eye as part of this because she most definitely did not always do what she was told. <laughs> and that's why we love her so much. Absolutely. Let's go back to the beginning when it comes to Mary Howard. For those listeners who don't know her very well, where did Mary grow up? So we think Mary was born in about 1519. Her father was Thomas Howard, the third Duke of Norfolk, and her mother was Elizabeth Stafford, one of the daughters of Edward Stafford, Duke of Buckingham. So Mary is top drawer aristocracy. Um, There is a slightly gruesome story about her birth. So content warning there for domestic violence. Her mother would later allege that when she'd been in labour two nights and a day with Mary, her father, so Norfolk, dragged her out of bed and around the house by her hair and wounded her in the head with a dagger. 
he wrote to Wolsey later on specifically to deny this, saying that she'd been putting this story about just to slander him. And he said that he could prove by witnesses that she'd had the scar on her head months before she gave birth to Mary and that no man would treat a woman who was in labour in that way and he wouldn't have done it for all that he was worth. So we don't know whether that's true or partly true or completely made up, but it does suggest that Mary's entry into the world might not have been especially smooth. <laughs> Their relationship uh, between the Duke of Norfolk and Elizabeth Stafford uh, was, uh, to say it was a rocky one is an understatement. Uh, how do you think her parents' relationship affected Mary in the future? It's difficult to know. I mean, for much of Mary's childhood, her parents may have been at odds. Uh, She would have been brought up in the family's houses in East Anglia. So Tendring Hall in Essex, Kenning Hall in Suffolk, probably Framlingham Castle a little bit later, um, along with her older sister Catherine and her brothers Henry and Thomas, at least for some of the time. Um, She wouldn't necessarily have spent a huge amount of time directly with her parents because she would have had a nursery staff and a governess and things like that. Um, Unfortunately, we don't know anything about her education and what she was taught. We know that her oldest brother, Henry, is really well educated. Um, And we do have letters from Mary that show that she could read and write. We know she read scripture in English and that she had books dedicated to her. Uh, Beyond that, it's unclear. So... In in her childhood, her parents' relationship might not have affected her too strongly. Um, The problem between her parents was that Mary's father took a mistress called Bess Holland, who had previously been in service in the household. And Mary's mother, Elizabeth, objected really strongly to that, which is quite unusual during that period. And then around Easter 1534, there was some kind of last straw event. We don't know exactly what. And Norfolk locked his wife in a chamber took her jewels and her valuable clothes and then took her to a house in Redbourne in Hertfordshire and left her there with a reduced household and income. Mary would have been about 15 at that point. And in 1534, she was in service at court with her cousin Anne Boleyn. And we just don't have any evidence that gives us any clue as to her real feelings about her parents' relationship. Um, She might not have had a lot of choice in in where she gave her loyalty. Her father is the one with the power and the money. So when Mary is unexpectedly widowed in 1536, she had no choice but to return to her father's house because she was still a minor and she didn't yet have access to money on her own. And she's not stupid. She knew which side her bread was buttered on and she doesn't seem to have made any open displays of support for her mother. Um, In fact, during the later 1540s, she lived at Kenning Hall with her father and his mistress, Bess Holland, which is something that her mother Elizabeth found very difficult to stomach. And it might be that her parents' marriage breakdown did influence her own decision to remain a widow and not to remarry later on. We can't be sure of that because there's no concrete evidence that that truly supports it. But it does make sense that she'd rather remain a widow with her own legal identity, her own income, more independence, than to put herself in a position where a future husband would legally be able to treat her in the same way that her father had treated her mother. You know, at the time of Mary's betrothal to Henry Fitzroy, her father had great favor with the king. Would that be safe to say? Yeah, I think that's fair. Uh, Yeah, Um, Mary's older brother, Henry, the Earl of Surrey, was a companion of Henry Fitzroy's when they grew up. Um, And Norfolk had been in charge of setting up that household. It's also the time of Anne Boleyn's rise, Henry has more or less decided that he'd like to marry Anne Boleyn next and therefore her family are are in in very high favour. Mary was actually at this point already betrothed to someone else when the Fitzroy marriage became an option. She was meant to marry the heir to the Earldom of Oxford and that would have been a good match as well. Uh, The de Vere family who were the Earls of Oxford and the Howards had intermarried before and they had a really good relationship and their, their estates are geographically next to each other so it made a lot of sense. But It becomes clear in the late 1520s, early 1530s, that the king is favourable to the idea of a Howard girl marrying his illegitimate son, Henry Fitzroy. Now, Mary had an older sister, Catherine, but Catherine had just been married to the young Earl of Derby, and that was a really, really lucrative match for the Howards. So rather than undo that, 
Mary's existing betrothal was broken so that she could marry Fitzroy. However, at that point in spring 1530, her older sister Catherine died very suddenly of plague right after the marriage to the Earl of Derby. The Howards didn't want to lose that match. And so Mary's mother thought that Mary should step into her sister's place and marry the Earl of Derby. But Anne Boleyn got involved at this stage. She was very keen to cement her own position in the royal family by creating other royal connections by marriage. And so she really wanted Mary to marry Henry Fitzroy. So Anne Boleyn and Mary's mother have a bit of a fight about it. High words get exchanged. Mary's mother is nearly sent away from court. But eventually Anne Boleyn got her way. Mary did marry Henry Fitzroy. And Mary's mother would later say that they didn't even have to pay any dowry. Anne had got the marriage for them by persuading the king. It's probable that Mary herself doesn't have a lot of say in this. She is only a teenager at this point. Um, And that's not to say that she's being coerced or marrying Fitzroy against her will, because generally speaking, daughters want the same economic and social things that their parents want for them. And romantic love usually isn't a primary consideration. Do we have any idea what kind of relationship Mary had with Henry Fitzroy? To be honest, not really. And this is partly because they're so young. Um, So they are married in 1533. But at that point, oh gosh, maths, Mary is only a teenager in her mid-teens. Fitzroy is about the same. And Fitzroy dies very unexpectedly and suddenly only three years later in the summer of 1536. And because he died so young, it's very hard to know what he was like as a person. And I mean... At this point, Mary's own character is probably still forming. They didn't ever live together because they were married so young that it was agreed that they were too young to cohabit and have sex and properly start married life. That's quite common for aristocratic marriages. They're made very early, but often the contract will specify that married life itself won't start until the pair are 18 or above. They would have known each other quite well, probably, from court service. But really, for Mary, aside from her title now being Duchess of Richmond and her now having the status of a wife, probably not a lot changed for her in daily life. And then in the summer of 1536, Henry Fitzroy dies. What was it exactly after Fitzroy's death that Mary was fighting for? Yeah, Fitzroy dies unexpectedly in the summer of 1536. We're not really sure what from. Um, I think... People often often say that it was it was some kind of tuberculosis, but realistically we don't know. And it's very difficult to diagnose something like that at a 500 year distance where diseases have changed and the way that we record symptoms has changed and so on. It just doesn't work very well. Uh, but yeah, 1536 is a really, really bad year for Henry VIII. So yes, Mary is suddenly a widow. She's only about 17, very young. When a marriage is made between aristocrats at this time, An agreement, or basically a contract, is drawn up between their families beforehand about the financial agreements, because marriage for the nobility is an economic contract above all. So the bride would bring a dowry with her. Occasionally that's land, but more usually by this point it's cash. And in exchange, the groom's family earmarks the income from certain estates to go to her if she's left a widow, and that's called jointure. But it wasn't always easy for women to actually get their hands on their jointure in practice. And this was Mary's problem. Her father-in-law was Henry VIII. He had allegedly assured her a jointure of a thousand marks a year when she married Fitzroy. And now that she's widowed, she is legally entitled to that money. But the king, being Henry VIII, wasn't very keen to pay out. And he said that because the marriage had never been consummated, he didn't owe her anything. And there are arguments over this for several years. Legally, the king is in the wrong. But you can't just tell Henry VIII he's wrong. You need to go through the rigmarole, a lot of legal advice, and you need to convince him over time without annoying him so much that um, he does whatever he wants. Now, Mary's father is responsible for acting on her behalf, and so Mary expected him to do the necessary work to convince the king. But she seems to have thought that he wasn't doing it fast enough or working hard enough, which is a bit unfair because we can see from surviving evidence pretty much every letter that her father writes to Thomas Cromwell during these years has a sentence in it 
um, about Mary's jointure, saying, please help her, please, please sort this out. But Mary can't necessarily see that. She thinks he's not working hard enough. So she consulted her own legal counsel, and then she emotionally blackmails her father. He writes that uh, she keeps, with weeping and wailing, demanding to go up to court and talk to the king herself. And this is where the first marriage, or uh, the marriage that they wanted with Thomas Seymour, comes in. So Mary's father, the Duke of Norfolk, along with the king, Thomas Cromwell, and the Seymour family all got together to concoct a nice new plan. If Mary were to remarry, then they could quietly brush that question of her jointure under the carpet, and the whole problem would be solved. And Thomas Seymour was chosen, probably because he's a good option for the Howards. The Seymours are uncles of the future king, Prince Edward VI, so it was really sensible for Thomas Howard to create a kinship tied to them for the future. Thomas Seymour is the younger son, but he's the one who's single. So quietly, they make all the arrangements, and then Norfolk lets Mary go to court to talk to the king about her jointure. And while she's there, they seem to have surprised her with this plan. It's not 100% clear what happened next, but basically, she seems to have refused point blank and gone straight back to Kenninghall, and Norfolk was left um, embarrassed and having to apologise for her. And by that point, it was 1538, and shortly after that, the king eventually did cave in and give her the estates that would pay her jointure. So Mary did win that battle. After, what, five years? Yeah. Wow. Well, good for her. You know, one of the things I think that drew me to Mary Howard the most was the quote I read one time that her father said that she was too wise for a woman. Yes, he did say that. And he said that during this fiasco over her jointure when she is consulting her own counsel and trying to get him to agree to let her go and deal with it herself and he writes to Cromwell saying oh god is this a good idea I really don't want to annoy the king that would be a really bad idea what do you think and he says I've never had cause to talk with Mary about anything serious like this and I did not expect to find her as I do and that is too wise for a woman (laughs) I love it That is why I feel like so many people are drawn to her, too, because in that time period, she really came off as a strong woman who would stand up for what was right for herself. Absolutely. Yeah. And she is most of this time. She's still under 20 years old and she defies defies the king, defies her father, all the men around her. She is quite a force of nature. So you mentioned that in her earlier years that she um, there was a marriage ar- arrangement being made with the Earl of Oxford. Um, and then we talked about a possible marriage with Sir Thomas Seymour twice that was brought up. Was there anyone else that was considered for marriage with her? Not that we know of, no. No, so Sir Thomas Seymour was suggested once in the late 1530s and then again right near the end of Henry VIII's reign, for some of the same reasons. I think by that point, it was obvious that the king was not going to live forever and that there was going to be a minority rule under his son, Edward VI. And the minority normally has a regent or a regency council. The obvious people to be in charge on this occasion were the Seymour men because they're Prince Edward's uncles. And by that point, there's also a lot of religious instability with religious conservatives uh, versus religious progressives, normally known as evangelicals. Um, at court. The Duke of Norfolk is known as a conservative, but the Seymours, and in fact Mary herself, were evangelicals. And so it made sense for Norfolk to want to create that kind of alliance to match this likely shift in power towards the Seymours in time for the next reign. Uh, But again, it doesn't happen. And it's not so clear this time why it doesn't happen and whether Mary herself had anything to do with that. Uh, But no, she remained single and there's no other marriage known of suggested for her. And then her brother, the Earl of Surrey, tries to convince her to become a mistress of the king? Yeah, it's not clear whether he was completely serious about this. Uh, This is something that came out once her brother, Henry, Earl of Surrey, and her father, the Duke of Norfolk, were arrested right at the end of Henry's reign. And a lot of witness statements were taken 
Um, this is, it's a really bizarre episode because eventually her brother is convicted of treason, but on a charge of heraldry, of using royal arms that he wasn't entitled to. And that was kind of spun by his enemies and then taken by a really paranoid king as evidence that he and his father were after the throne, which I don't think was the case. And realistically, probably nobody actually believed it was the case. But the evangelicals wanted an excuse to get conservative Norfolk out of the way. And Mary gets mixed up in this because, of course, they want her to give a witness statement, which she does. And she's often blamed for having helped to condemn her father and her brother. And for some reason, some historians have seem to have thought that she did this deliberately. Um, the original depositions have since been lost, which is really annoying. They were in the fire of the cotton manuscripts back in the 18th century. But they were seen by Lord Herbert of Cherbury, who was Henry VIII's first biographer in the, I think, the late 16th century. And he wrote summaries of them in his text. And when you actually look at what survives, it seems that Mary did her best to follow a very careful path. She knew that she couldn't, you know, save her brother and her father, but she seems to have recognised that her father was the real target and that maybe she couldn't save her brother, but she could at least clear her father. And so she was deliberately quite vague in the answers that she gave about the heraldry they were using, which isn't realistic for a daughter of the Duke of Norfolk who's been brought up with heraldry all her life. So she does seem to have done her best. And it's as part of these witness statements that it is reported that her brother had said to her something like, well, why don't you seduce the king? And then you could be in a position of influence near him, like Madame d'Etant is with the French king. And Mary is horrified because the king is her father-in-law. And in the Tudor period, um, in-laws are as good as kind of blood relations. So it's, it's as though he's suggesting she should go and sleep with her dad. And she's absolutely horrified and says, absolutely not, you must be mad. Did she say something about slitting her own throat? Something like that, yeah. Off the top of my head, I'm not sure what the quote is, but it is something like, I would sooner die than do this or something like that. Fiery Mary, I love it. Now, Mary died um, in the 1550s. What was her what was her life like after Henry VIII died? After Henry died, her brother has been executed right at the very end of Henry's reign. Um, and her father was also imprisoned. He was due to be executed, but conveniently, Henry VIII died the same night that he signed the death warrant. And the Regency Council for the new king, Edward VI, thought that it was maybe a bad idea to start a new reign with bloodshed. And so they just left Norfolk where he was in the Tower of London for the entirety of Edward VI's reign. Um, and five years in the Tower of London would have finished off somebody weaker. And Thomas Howard is in his 70s by this point. But no, he carries on and he's eventually released at the start of Mary's reign. But during that time, Mary is there as an independent widow, no longer under the eye of her father. And she also has custody of her brother's children, her nephews and her nieces. So she spends Edward VI's reign bringing them up. She hires John Fox, the very famous Protestant martyrologist who wrote uh, Fox's Book of Martyrs. She hires him to be their tutor. And he starts to write the Book of Martyrs while within her household, which is a pretty big claim to fame. So she brings her nieces and nephews up, but she also furthers her own religious beliefs and her role as a patroness of evangelical writers during this period. She has a lot of books dedicated to her um, and the freedom to do that must have been really welcome to her. Well, thank you so much for letting us all know and see a little bit inside of the life of Mary Howard. We've now reached the part of the show, the new segment of the show, If I Made You Choose. So this is the part where I make you choose between two people from the Tudor period without explanation. Okay, cool. Let's go. <laughs> okay. The first one is Elizabeth Stafford or Bess Holland. Oh, Elizabeth Stafford, it has to be. The next one is Anne Boleyn or Elizabeth I. Oh, that's actually harder. Mm, I think think i think i would say elizabeth the first the next one is cardinal wolsey or thomas cromwell oh thomas cromwell and the last one this one is my personal favorite if you had to choose 
Edward Seymour or Thomas Seymour? Oh, God. Oh, that's like Prince William or Prince Harry. We used to do that at school. Um, okay. Edward Seymour is the sensible one, but Thomas Seymour seems to have been the hot one, if that makes sense. <laughs> I would prob- oh, ah, I'd probably go for Thomas Seymour because they both end up executed and you might as well have some fun beforehand. <laughs> I'd love you are the, the second person this season that I've asked that question to and Thomas it was picked that time for the same reason that he seems like he'd be the more exciting one to be around <laughs> I don't think he's a good choice for marriage clearly but um, <laughs> Edward Seymour just really doesn't seem like a lot of fun at all Thank you so much, Nikki, for being on the show today and talking about Mary Howard and answering my silly questions. Thanks very much for having me. It's been fun. If you'd like to find out the reasons why Nikki chose the answers she did, become a patron at patreon.com slash tutors dynasty and get all the scoop. And now ask the expert. Nicola, welcome to Ask the Expert. Pleasure. Thank you so much for having me. I am so excited today to uh, present you with some listener submitted questions about Margaret Beaufort. So are you ready? I'm ready. I'm excited. (laughs) (laughs) So we'll start with Michelle in Germany asks, how do you think Margaret was influenced by her first marriage, the one she did not recognize to John Duke of Suffolk? Did the experience of being connected to someone as reviled as William Duke of Suffolk shape her? Um, I, it, I it's a really tricky question, um, and one that it's going to be difficult for me to answer because anything I say is going to be speculative because we don't have any evidence at all as to how Margaret felt about um, the De La Paul family. Or, you know, she never even recognised this first marriage. As far as she was concerned, she had three husbands rather than four. And her first husband was Henry Stafford. So I think we could speculate that the fact that she never even acknowledged this first marriage to De La Paul kind of hints at the fact that perhaps she really didn't want to be associated with the Suffolks and the De La Pauls. Um, I don't think, I think it's very difficult to say whether um, whether it shaped her, the marriage shaped her going forward. I'd say probably not because there's no evidence that she ever even met her bridegroom at this time during her childhood, um, apart from you know, when they they underwent this marriage ceremony of words only. You know, there's no evidence that they spent any time together whatsoever. And the likelihood is that Margaret would have remained living with her mother and her mother's household. So um, I think uh, think it's impossible to say yet whether um, it would have had any kind of bearing or influence on her. But from what we can infer, I'd say that it's highly unlikely. Just as a refresher for the listeners who may not be as familiar, how old was Margaret at the time of that marriage? Um, So she was six years old at that time. So, I mean, you know, even the most precocious of six-year-olds would have found it difficult to understand what was going on at that time, you know, if they were being, um, if they were undergoing some kind of marriage ceremony of words, it wouldn't have meant a great deal to her at that time. Like I say, given that the likelihood is that she went home and carried on living with her mother after that, you know, um, so I find it very difficult to believe that it would have made any huge or significant impact on her. And as I say, the fact that she never even recognised that marriage um, later on sort of suggests that she very much sort of wrote it off and, um, and didn't really give it a second thought. Now, the next question comes from Carol Ann in Washington, D.C., and she said, if I remember correctly, she saw you speak in uh, at Winchester last year. 
Oh, okay, cool. Yeah. Carol Ann says, I'm fascinated by how Henry VII created the the legend of the Tudor Rose and the backstory for the Wars of the Roses that leads so neatly to the Tudor Rose. After all, he'd never been a courtier and had spent just 14 years in France or Brittany in exile. So my question is, do you think Margaret Beaufort, the person who knew and navigated the royal court better than anyone, helped Henry come up with this narrative? Um, I think it's certainly feasible that she would have had some impact um, on on him in terms of that, yes, and that they would have had conversations about that um, because Margaret was extremely conscious of her own lineage and her own royal connections and they were something that she was extremely proud of. And, you know, in turn, her son, Henry VII, was also extremely proud of these connections. And they took care to to demonstrate them and to kind of shout them from the rooftops, really, at every available opportunity. And so, yeah, I do certainly think that she would have had an impact on impressing this on Henry and that certainly they would have conversed together about this. and. Um, I'm sure that Margaret would have made her views known to her son. And, you know, the, the evidence that we do have suggests that Henry, you know, also was very open to and responsive to Margaret's opinions and um, her, her views on things. So I'm sure, yeah, that we can not know for certain, but that we can infer that um, she would have had some bearing on that, yes. And a follow-up to that, Sarah on Facebook wanted you to maybe elaborate a little bit more on Henry VII's legitimacy and his claim to the throne. Can you elaborate for listeners a little bit where his claim came from? Yeah, sure. So again, it it all came through Margaret and her side of the family. Um, She was descended from John of Gaunt, who was the third surviving son of Edward III. Um, But the the problem, if you like, or the the question sort of came in through the fact that um, Margaret was a descendant of John of Gaunt through his liaison and then marriage to Catherine Swinford. Um, And at the time that the children born to Catherine and John were were born, Catherine was John's mistress rather than his wife. Um, And so all of these four children who were given the surname Beaufort um, were rendered illegitimate by reason of their parents' um, a, a relationship at that time. And Catherine and John were later married and their children were legally legitimated. Um, but because of the fact that all four of these Beaufort children, through which Margaret Beaufort and thus Henry VII were descended, um, they there there sprang this sort of this doubt over their legitimacy because all four of the Beaufort children were born out of wedlock. Um and you know, Henry the Seventh's enemies subsequently um you know jumped on this as an opportunity to um to really highlight the fact that they believed that he was illegitimate and didn't have a, a strong enough claim to the throne. And I mean, you know, certainly in the whole grand scheme of things, his claim to the throne was um was very small uh, given the other contenders who were around in the 1480s. Um, but Henry was certainly very proud of this claim, um, which stemmed from, from the Beauforts. And um, in the first parliament of his reign, he kind of took care to reaffirm the legitimacy of the Beauforts. Um, so as I say, it was a link that was he was very, very proud of and that Margaret was very, very proud of. But it was one that was kind of, you know, dubious um, and born on dubious grounds. One of the things I remember from your book, um, Uncrowned Queen, was exactly um, the legitimacy part with Richard II and Henry IV. Um, 
What was the difference again? It, it's escaping me at the moment, but Richard II said one thing and then Hedri- Henry IV said another, but it wasn't finalized? Yeah, so what it was was that, um, so in 1397, um, Richard II legitimated the, the Beaufort children of um, Catherine Swinford and John of Gaunt. And when um, Henry IV usurped the throne in 1399 he he later in um in 1407 he reaffirmed the legitimacy of the Beauforts so you know he reinforced what Richard II had said but he added a, a further clause to this which said um accepting royal dignity which was basically saying that Yes, the Beauforts were legitimate, but they didn't have a claim to the throne and they couldn't ever claim the throne. But very crucially, this clause, so the accepting royal dignity, that was never passed through Parliament. And so that was, you know, the the basis on which Henry the Seventh Seventh was you know, able to drum up support for his claim was because this clause um, saying that the Beaufort offspring could never accede to the throne had never been confirmed by Parliament. So almost by sheer luck. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it really was in many ways. Um, yeah, you certainly could say that. <laughs> All right. Now, the next question comes from Alyssa on Facebook, and this is all about the relationship between Margaret Beaufort and Elizabeth of York and (laughs) the infamous (laughs) relationship. Um, She wants to know, there seems to be some debate on whether Margaret and Queen Elizabeth got along, especially with how Margaret took more of more of a lead or put herself in the spotlight more than normal. However, Mm -hmm. She wonders if she ever aggravated other people like courtiers or others trying to get close to the the king. Did anyone ever question Margaret's slightly abnormal behavior? Do you know? No, they didn't, actually. Um, The relationship between Elizabeth and Margaret is something I'm asked about quite a lot. And um, it's something that I always kind of take care I don't know it's something I've always treated with with caution because actually the um the evidence that suggests that they had any kind of disharmony or discord in their relationship only comes from one source which was the Spanish ambassador in 1498 and actually all other contemporary evidence suggests that Margaret and Elizabeth shared quite a warm relationship and quite a close relationship. And Margaret certainly um, certainly took a great interest in Elizabeth and everything that she did. And I think perhaps if, um, if Elizabeth had been of a more, um, I don't know, let's just say of a more dominant character, um, you know, lots of reports uh, talk about the fact that she was very gentle by nature. But I think if she'd been more of a forceful personality, then she and Margaret certainly would have clashed more, perhaps. Um, but no, there's no evidence, actually, that Margaret got on anybody else's nerves, so to speak, although I'm sure she probably did, <laughs> um, because she was a very dominant force and um, a very strong personality who wasn't afraid to push herself forward. And you can kind of understand it, I think, because she'd spent so much time away from Henry the Seventh when he had been in exile in um, in France and Brittany. And even before then, you know, she'd been separated from him for a great part of her childhood. So I think it's only natural that she wanted to be close to him at court and to share in his success. Um, So I'm sure, yeah, she would have probably annoyed people and rubbed people up the wrong way. Um, But I don't think anybody would have dared to challenge that because everybody knew that she was held in such high regard by her son, the king. Um, And actually, all of the other evidence that that we have shows that she was actually very well regarded by a lot of people and particularly her household. They absolutely adored her. Um, and, and everybody spoke very highly of her within her household and talked about how generous she was, how kind she was. Um, 
so I think um yeah as I said there's no there's no sort of evidence direct evidence that she uh she had arguments or strange relationships with anybody in particular um but I'm sure you know I'm sure that there probably would have been occasions then when yes she um perhaps got ideas above her station <laughs> <laughs> and and rightfully, she had a claim to the throne herself. So why do you think that she wanted her son to take that instead of herself? Was it just because she was a woman or why do you think Margaret was willing to step back and allow her son to be the heir, so to speak? Yeah, I mean, I think I think I think probably largely the fact that she was a woman um would have had uh, would have been the overriding factor but i don't ever really think that she seriously considered herself as a contender to the throne to be perfectly honest i think that all of her ambitions and all of her hopes were for her son and you know, that was the way that it had always been and i think from the moment that he was born her her instinct was to protect him and to um you know to keep him safe as far as she was able and i think that that was very much her her instinct up until 1483 when edward the 4th died unexpectedly and i think that it was only then that she saw this opportunity for henry and um I think if you consider, you know, what was going on at this time, you know, um, as I say, Edward the Fourth, King, died unexpectedly. He had two male heirs, um, and then there's obviously Richard the Third, who, uh, you know, um, let's just say, well, he imprisons them anyway. Um, and I think so. If you look at it, all of those contenders for the throne are male, and. I don't think there would have been any question at that time of Margaret putting herself forward. And even if she had, I don't think, I don't think she would have had any support for any claim to the throne. And I think she probably would have recognised that. So I think her son was certainly, um, you know, the most viable Lancastrian alternative. Um, so, yeah, I, I just don't think that she ever really would have considered herself as a contender. Now, Betsy in North Carolina brings up the question that we probably hear the most, and I'm sure that you have debunked this a million times, but let's talk a little bit about Margaret's drive to put her son on the throne. Yeah. Okay. Really, really, when it comes down to it, that wasn't her initial mission, correct? Correct. Uh, thanks to popular culture in, in recent years, there has been this misconception a huge misconception that from the moment of henry tudor's birth margaret's sole aim was to put him on the throne and she believed that that was his god given right and his destiny and that's just not true um you know you have to consider that the time that henry the seventh was was born you know the the wars of the roses were underway um at that time uh, Henry VI was, of course, on the throne. He's got a male heir of his own. Um, and Margaret was wholeheartedly loyal to her Lancastrian family. And at that time, her sole consideration was to ensure her son's safety and well-being. Um, and that remains the case throughout the Wars of the Roses. And that's why you know, Henry ends up setting sail for France, although ends up in Brittany in 1471, um, because contemporary several contemporary sources say, and I think you know that they're probably right, that this was done at Margaret's urging. You know that she urged him to flee abroad for his own safety, because 1471, following the Battle of Tewkesbury and um, the murder of Henry VI and his heir um, Edward of Lancaster. I think Margaret then realised that Henry was in a potentially dangerous situation as a Lancastrian heir and needed to 
you know keep him safe and to preserve him so yes he goes he goes off abroad and then it is only in 1483 that things change um because it's very obvious that prior to that or there is evidence that prior to that margaret was working very much to try and effect a reconciliation for her son with edward the fourth and um she'd actually managed to get Edward IV to draft a pardon for Henry Tudor. But unfortunately for Margaret and, you know, frustratingly for for Henry, Edward died before he could sign the pardon. And and then, of course, everything falls into a complete disarray when um, Edward V is deposed and Richard III assumes the throne in his stead and i think at that point you know margaret had no idea what richard's attitude towards henry was going to be you know would he be as conciliatory as his brother had been or would he be more antagonistic and i think she also recognized that richard's um usurpation was unpopular and it was this really that led her to see this opportunity for her son and made her think, okay, well, Richard's unpopular. Um, Who can we put forward as an alternative? Oh yeah, there's my son. He's in, he's abroad. Um, So I think that, yeah, it's very, very clear that prior to 1483, Margaret's hopes for her son were all centred around keeping him safe and it's only really because of chance through um, Edward the Fourth's death in 1483 that the whole change in her attitude and her ambitions comes about. And if you're fascinated by Margaret Beaufort, like most people are, I highly recommend that you pick up Nicola's book, Uncrowned Queen, which is pretty much available everywhere. I will include links in the show notes as well so that you can buy your own copy today. Nicola, thank you so much for answering the listener questions. Thank you so much. It's been a pleasure. And now a brief history. The earliest references to what we know as court gestures, or fools, date back to the 5th dynasty of Egypt, whose pharaohs employed pygmies as dancers and buffoons. For centuries, royalty and nobility have hired comic entertainers whose perceived madness or imbecility, whether real or pretended, as I will explain shortly, provided amusement to their superiors. The two different types of fools that have been chronicled over the years were the natural or innocent fool, who would have had mental or even physical disabilities and were not necessarily in control of their faculties, and the merry fool who were entertainers of sound mental health, but pretended to seem impaired for the entertainment of others. The innocent fool was defined in 1616 by Nicholas Breton as one abortive of wit where nature had more power than reason, and was believed to be, to some extent, closer to God, and therefore highly valued by nobility. Although they were employed for entertainment purposes, they were treated as precious possessions of the court. Fools throughout history were almost entirely male, yet the star of our story today was a somewhat more elusive female fool simply known as Jane. Jane's birth and early years have never been recorded, so all we really know of her life were fragments of time between the years 1535 and 1558, for the most part. Her existence is only known to us by way of accounts mentioned by Anne Boleyn in the last year or so of her life, through the privy purse expenses of Princess Mary, and certain purchasing records of Queen Catherine Parr. She's also widely accepted as a background figure in a famous painting of Henry VIII and his family. More to come on that as well. Records show a purchase for Her Grace's Woman Fool in December 1535 during the reign of Anne Boleyn. Now this presumably referred to Jane and included a green satin cap and 25 yards of fringe used for the trimming of a dress. Jane doesn't seem to have been particularly important to Boleyn. 
When she was executed in May 1536, Anne's household was dispersed, and Jane likely went into the care of the Princess Mary, the place where she was loved and cared for for the next 20 or so years. Princess Mary treated Jane with fondness and affection, despite still making her shave her head every few weeks, as the male fools had to do as well. Jane actually developed a skin infection on her scalp in March of 1543, probably from the constant head shaving. Mary provided Jane with an expensive wardrobe, lessons on the virginals and the loot, and interestingly, an unusually extensive shoe collection. Now what girl wouldn't like that? It's also mentioned in several sources that Jane's tenure overlapped with Lucretia the Tumblers and that they were given identical clothing. In 1542, it's said that a pair of shoes for Jane and another for Lucretia were purchased, followed by a set of smocks for both as well. It's suggested that Lucretia, although a trained entertainer, more of the merry kind of fool I discussed earlier, Versus Jane, a natural fool, was her close companion who potentially acted as her keeper. Another of Jane's contemporaries was Will Somers, the fool to Henry VIII. Some say that he may have had a romantic relationship with Jane, or that the two were even married, but that's highly unlikely. Remember his name, because I'll be mentioning him again. Moving on to 1543, when Henry VIII married Catherine Parr, and both Elizabeth and Mary were restored to the line of succession, Parr was compassionate enough to bring Mary's beloved fool into her own care. The new queen allowed Jane to care for a small flock of chickens in a privy garden, for her entertainment and to allow her a sense of responsibility. Shortly thereafter, what would become an extremely famous portrait was painted of Henry's family. This painting, The Family of Henry VIII, was completed in 1544-45 and can currently be found in Hampton Court Palace. Although this work of art could have an entire segment dedicated to it alone, I'll try to stick to the topic at hand. But be sure to check out the show notes to see the painting I'm referring to. There are many theories surrounding why it was painted the way it was, mainly because the queen featured beside the main focal point... Henry, of course, was Jane Seymour, the wife who had been dead for nearly a decade, and not his current wife and consort, Catherine Parr. Henry and Jane Seymour's son Edward is found at the right of the king, implying that this threesome would have been the holy trinity of family. Then positioned on the outer sides of the trio are Elizabeth and Mary, also potentially implying that although they had been formally reintroduced into the succession, that they were still considered outside of the true family unit. But I'm rambling. The theories behind this painting really are interesting, and I would strongly suggest that you look into the hypothesis about why each object and person are positioned the way they are. Now, the reason I mention the portrait is because of the people painted on the far outer edges of it. To the right is Will Somers, Henry's fool, with a monkey on his back, and he looks like he's picking his head for lice. And to the left, none other than our Jane. She seems to be looking away at something out of sight of the painting, and is wearing a tight-fitting cap, likely covering her recently shorn hair and her uniform, which was an expensive outfit cut in the Dutch style, rather than the more fashionable French style, to show lower rank than royals or nobles. Her gown consisted of a kirtle, the outer gown, with an upstanding collar parted in the front to reveal a pleated underskirt, or a forepart. The fact that Jane and Will were both added to this painting implies significant status within the royal family. As we approach 1546, records with the mention of Jane just cease to exist. We do not know what happened to her after Henry passed in 1547, as all documentation referencing her employment or whereabouts is simply not found. However, again in 1553, a new batch of orders for the newly crowned Queen Mary I were purchased. We can see that she bought fine gowns and petticoats for Jane, made from such fabrics as lace, silks, and satin, quality items that generally would have only been worn by the Queen's ladies and nobles. 
Jane's job as Mary's fool would have included telling stories, jokes, singing songs, and playing music. Yet we also know that after their many years together, that the queen had a fondness for Jane. The women would go riding together, and Jane would even gamble with the queen, one of Mary's favorite pastimes. Jane and Will Somers were further elevated in the standing under Queen Mary and given special lodgings and matching outfits for their performances. Jane was also included in the St. Valentine's Day lottery every year until 1558. This meant that every year, men of the court drew ladies' names to find out their dancing partners. Once chosen, the woman had to buy gifts for their valentine, a task which was done by the queen each year on behalf of Jane. In fact, she was entirely supported by Queen Mary until the end of Mary's life. She was well-clothed, even better than most of the ladies at court. She paid for the laundering of all of her garments, bought all of her needlework so Jane could practice sewing, and any other daily costs of living were all supplied by Mary. In late 1555, Jane experienced some sort of illness or infection involving one of her eyes, which required treatment. As usual, Queen Mary stepped in and not only paid for the physician's care, but also for an around-the-clock caregiver to attend Jane. Gifts were continuously sent during the time of her healing. Mary maintained her relationship with Jane right up until her death, with records showing that even in her last year of life, the Queen was still ordering new clothes for her fool. Unfortunately, once Mary I passed and Elizabeth was crowned, there was once again no mention of Jane anywhere. What evidence I have found come from a Victorian writer called Augustus Jessops. Now, Jessops appears highly regarded, and for that reason, I'm repeating what he wrote. But normally, I'm skeptical of any Victorian records. Now, he says, Among the closest and the dearest of the Princess Mary's friends and attendants were Henry Jerningham and his wife, who was her lady-in-waiting, and had attended upon her at her coronation. Now, Queen Mary knighted Henry Jerningham and appointed him vice-chamberlain in 1556 and master of the horse in 1557. He was also given some very extensive grants of land and more. Upon the accession of Queen Elizabeth, Jerningham lost all hope of preferment, as he was of the old faith, like Queen Mary. So he retired from court and moved to Norfolk. Sir Henry Jerningham died in 1573, and in his will made mention of one Jane or Joan Cooper. In it, he gave her his old gown, and also mentioned that he willed that his wife, and all his heirs as well, provided for her throughout her life. Jerningham's wife, named Frances, did exactly as her husband had requested, and upon her own death, she added, Also, I do give unto Jane, or Joan, the fool, four pounds in money, or two shillings a year, as long as she liveth, which shall be thought best for her at the discretion of my executor. She also gave Jane her one feather bed bolster and cover, Now, a bed was one of the most prized possessions at the time, so Jane, if this is the same Jane the Fool, was definitely loved by her mistress. Jessup mentions how he found evidence from a parish record that Jane Cooper was buried on the 14th of April, 1585. But if that story is untrue, it's unknown then if she too died right after Mary I or simply was not accepted into the household of Mary's younger sister. Will Somers is recorded as having been at Elizabeth's coronation, yet already by that time, Jane seems to have vanished. Even with the extremely close relationship that Mary and Jane had for over 20 years, there was no surname, birth date, or death date that was ever recorded for her, unless this Victorian writer is correct. There are also accounts for a beat in the fool during Mary's reign, and it's sometimes suggested as having been Jane, with Beaton potentially having been her surname. But most sources believe that that was an entirely different person altogether. Surname or no, Jane, our fool, was clearly held in high regard by each queen who employed her. The exceptional care they took of this innocent girl 
was not necessarily common for the time, which is why even today we still want to know about the fool in the Dutch dress and Henry VIII's family portrait. Thanks for checking out the Tudor's Dynasty podcast. Read more. Read more on the blog at TudorsDynasty.com. Follow Tudor's Dynasty on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Subscribe to Tudor's Dynasty on iTunes. Thanks for listening.